And that work was done in in um, in Visual Basic for Excel, right? Which um, you know is if you didn't know, right? On the back end of your Excel spreadsheets, there is, uh, or at least used to be, a compu you know, a, a programming language, and it was Visual Basic, so it would actually allow you to do things like create buttons on spreadsheets that you could press to run macros and scripts, um, and do a lot of these calculations in the background, and then spit them out to um, to the spreadsheet and. I really actually sort of enjoyed that and I enjoyed different elements of that. Um, I really actually kind of geeked out on the coding part, right? So I, I was making probably some graphic graphical user interfaces that were like way unnecessary for the particular thing that was being done. But I, I really actually started to enjoy coding um, as something as part of the scientific process. So that continued. I, I, I actually was offered a master's um, research assistantship by that same person that I was working for on a slightly sort of different project. It was funded by the Environmental Protection Agency at the time, and it was very geospatial in, in nature. And so what we were doing is we were um, extending some of the capabilities of um, this existing GIS tool. Um, at the time, it was, it was Arc Info. Um, and we were extending it to do some more advanced terrain analysis on digital elevation data for watersheds in Colorado, Oregon, and Washington. Um, and, and that was the first time I, I really got involved in a project that involved a degree of, of using a scripted language. In this case, it was something called Arc Macro Language, which I presume nobody has heard of, um, and a compiled code. Um, that I was actually writing, right? So I would write these kind of terrain analysis codes in C, and then I would, you know, do some pre-processing of my data in Arc Info, and then I would use this Arc Macro language to wrap my C code, and I would call that code, and I would do some post-processing again in Arc Info, right? So it was this um, process of kind of chaining together workflows um, using a variety of different languages. So that that became and will continue to be a theme in the talk today. Um, for my PhD, um, as Donna mentioned, I went to MIT and that work was actually uh, funny enough. Um, and, and Michal and I have shared some texts about this or uh, Twitter tweets about this. Um, I was doing some work funded by the Army Research Office to combine um, satellite observations of soil moistures with model estimates um, in order to predict soil moisture. Um, the Army was interested in this because they're interested in, in where they can drive their tanks without getting them stuck in the mud. This all of a sudden is a very relevant thing in this day and age. Um, and, and that work was really a combination of um, a model that already exists and was written in a combination of C and C++, uh, some what are known as data assimilation algorithms that um, I, I coded in, um, in C and C++. And then, you know, again, using a, a, a commercial piece of code um, in the form of MATLAB in order to kind of visualize and create those plots that ultimately went into the publications that came out of my PhD. So since arriving at Boise State, um, you know, there's, you know, in the past 10 years, there's been a really big shift in emphasis towards, you know, open source codes, um, reproducibility in our scientific workflows, um, you know, moving away from kind of, uh, you know, platforms like, you know, MATLAB and more towards platforms like Python, R, Julia, right, that are open source. Um, but my group today and the kind of work that we do, right, it still involves, um, you know, so, so we're very, very out front about, um, you know, wanting to produce open source and reproducible code, but we're still dealing with, and our group still uses extensively, um, these models that are in leg legacy languages, right? So what this looks like frequently is that we're writing code in Python and sometimes R, but we're also kind of reading and tweaking code in Fortran and some of the bigger models that we're we're using, right? So, um, so students need to be kind of fluent in some kind of high level, you know, data sciencey language like Python or R. But they also need to be able to kind of converse a little bit in some of these other languages. So, 
you know, I'm, I'm currently kind of putting together um, my materials for promotion to full professor. And so it's given me an opportunity to kind of reflect on, you know, how I think about, you know, the work that I do and my contributions as a scholar and really kind of um, I came up with this diagram as, as a way of kind of presenting the kind of intersecting focuses of of my of my scholarly existence. Right. So from a scientific perspective, we are interested in advancing understanding of mountain ecoclimate systems um, in a changing climate. And the next part of the story will be about that exactly. Um, but really, I've developed a passion for equipping students with the computing skills and perspectives to be able to solve modern environmental problems, right? So a lot of my graduate students finished their masters, some finished PhDs, um, and you know, a lot of them are now in, in kind of management organizations like the Idaho Department of Water Resources, um, uh, the USGS, the NAT. Um, Natural Resources Conservation Service. So they're actually kind of actively involved in managing water resources in Idaho and the West. Um, and I am really passionate about making sure that the students that we produce have the skills that will, um, a set of sustainable skills that will allow them to kind of adapt to both changes in the computational landscape as we kind of you know, get better at producing tools and produce new tools and, and new data sets come online, but also kind of be able to adapt to the changing environment, right? Which is which is changing at sort of a, um, an increasingly rapid pace. Um, I also think of, you know, this computational focus area, right? As of computational science as, as one that um, is, is kind of unique in the geosciences um, because it's it's one way to kind of broaden participation to historically excluded groups in the earth and environmental sciences, right? So in earth and um, earth and environmental sciences are among the least diverse or probably the most the least diverse fields um, in the STEM fields. Part of that is kind of the way that we recruit, right? We are sort of often very oriented towards recruiting people that like to spend time and have had the privilege to have opportunities to spend time outside but i think of um these marketable skills right as as ways of um allowing folks to authentically do earth and environmental science that doesn't necessarily require them to have the same outdoor abilities opportunities and privileges as some of our other colleagues so i see it as, as a way of expanding expanding the base of people that can authentically participate in the earth and environmental sciences okay so let's pivot now to that second story, which is um, a, an example, right? A particular kind of um, use case, if you will, of our, our research group's work. Um, and so I'll start at the sort of broadest part of the, or the broadest perspective of our group's work is that, you know, we study kind of the interactions between humans and the water cycle. So even if you're not a geoscientist, you probably have seen a figure like this before. Right, this is a, a picture depicting the water cycle and both its its water fluxes here that are shown as blue arrows, right, um, and its uh, energy fluxes that are shown in the yellow and orange arrows, right, and and we think of this as an integrated system, right. So this is a cycle, you know, with which um, water evaporates uh, off of the ocean, condenses, and is transported over the land, falls as precipitation, either as rain or snow in the mountains that you know uh snow ultimately melts and finds its ways into rivers and that um, those rivers find their way ultimately back to the ocean completing the cycle one of the key facets about the modern hydro the way that we think about the hydrologic cycle in a modern way but also in particular here in the west is that humans kind of short circuit this hydrologic cycle right we um, we do things like impound water from these streams in, in dams and reservoirs, so places like Lucky Peak, Arrow Rock, Anderson Ranch, just upstream of us, right? We, we manage that water, we uh, divert it into a series of canals um, and ditches where it's ultimately used as irrigation to grow food that um, is either used to feed stock or used to feed us directly. 
right? But um, as part of that, we're, we're now taking water that maybe historically would have wound up in the ocean and routing it back to the atmosphere, right? So that the plants can acquire carbon, grow, and we can harvest them and, and use them in food production. So um, this is a, a pretty fundamental shift. And, and you can see the ways in which we um, influence this, uh, the hydrologic cycle in the West is, is simply the patterns of of crops that we see in the Western United States, for instance, in the, in the Snake River Plain. Um, you can see this as well in, in our neck of the woods, right? So a lot of our study is kind of based right here in the Boise River Basin, um, but this is kind of a canonical Western landscape. I grew up in, in Colorado. Um, the, the story is, is very similar there. We just had a speaker Monday who was talking about the Denver metro area. Right. And, and the idea here is that we kind of, you know, here in Boise, we have these upland watershed systems that are mostly, you know, forested mountains, right? The, the sawtooths are over here on the eastern side of the Boise River Basin. The upper Boise River Basin is shown here in the green outline. Um, this is a system that's that's dominated by kind of snowfall, right? So, um, moisture transported in from the um uh off of the ocean um ultimately is is lifted orographically through topographic processes it falls as snowfall and builds up seasonal snow snowpacks that serve as a natural reservoir here in the upper boise um during the spring runoff season which is which is right now we um, that snow melt ultimately finds its ways into the human reservoirs of our systems. Um, and then we use that to sort of distribute that water to the various agricultural um, uh, agricultural farms that you see here um, in, in brown and yellow in the Treasure Valley. But at the same time, you know, this system is stressed. As you all know, you know, there's a lot more people um, that are moving into the landscape. What's funny is uh, I was just noting that when I first started using this particular figure um, in presentations, this approximate population was 670,000. I've now had to update this to 750,000, right? So we have lots of, of stresses associated with people moving into the landscape, stresses of invasive species like cheatgrass, um, intensification of the land and water use and of course um you know changes due to climate so um you know i don't have to convince all of you that agriculture is economically and socially important to the to the treasure valley region but i would i would just kind of give you a, a couple of quick um data points right so the region produces about 700 million dollars a year in annual revenue so um, agriculture is a, a, a very important uh, economic sector in Idaho. Um, that is, it encompasses about 500,000 acres in the Treasure Valley. So it's, it's a very large area. Um, and there's a, about, when you look at the data, there's about 150 different crops that are grown in the Treasure Valley area, right? So it's a, it's a very diverse um, portfolio of crops that this region produces, right? And it, it turns out that some of those crops and the, the kinds of crops, so uh, you may not know it, but we're very well known as being a seed crop producing state. Um, those crops are actually strategically important to the national agri agricultural enterprise in general, right? So a lot of those crops are grown just for their seeds, which are then sold to farms um, all throughout the United States. So, um, of, of course, you know, the one of the biggest stress stressors that we think about in our group is is climate change and, and warming um, and how that alters water availability. And so we've known for at least 15 years and suspected for longer that climate change will have a, a, a fairly dramatic impact on the hydrologic cycle in the Western United States. Um, and so this this occurs in a variety of different mechanisms. Right, um, but it's it's kind of a chain reaction of of events that through which um, climate change alters water availability. So, um, in about 2006, this paper by Knowles et al. was was published, um, and they were looking at um, a variety of of stations throughout the Western United States, um, and almost all of them showed kind of this change 
in the fraction of precipitation throughout the course of the year um, towards less snow and more rain, right? So as the climate warms, we would suspect, and in fact, this paper demonstrated through observations that we see in this increasing trend of, of precipitation falling as rain and not snow. Um, and not surprisingly, right, when you kind of carry that thought line through, what you see is that, well, if you have less precipitation falling as, as snow and more as rain in the springtime, right, so right now in April, when we would expect those snowpacks to be kind of at their largest, um, we are seeing a, a decrease in the amount of, of snowpack in the spring, right, and the snowpack is really important um, in terms of, of being a natural reservoir of water to sustain those, uh, those flows later on into the growing season, right? So this was a paper by Phil Mote et al. in about that same time, in about 2005, showing at um, snow tell stations throughout the Western US, um, how snowpack was declining on this key April 1st date, right? Which is kind of our historical date of the, the peak of the snowpack. And then, of course, you know, carrying that further through, right, is that um, if you're getting more rain um, or more of your precipitation is arriving as rain um, and you're getting snowpacks that are, are not as large as they were historically, that you would presumably see runoff occurring earlier. And that's, in fact, exactly kind of what this Stewart et al. paper shows. They looked at a number of USGS stream gauges and they showed that um, there's quite significant trends in the timing of, of peak and a variety of other metrics of our, our runoff, right? So our runoff is coming down our rivers earlier. Um, so all in all, these papers together tell us that snowmelt dominated watersheds are especially vulnerable to climate change. So that is where our group comes in. We use a variety of computational tools and data to ask questions and perform numerical experiments, asking things like, what if this happens? Or how well can we predict um, things like the stream flow? Can we predict it well historically? And then um, going forward into the future, what might that tell us about, um, what might that tell us about how the the hydrologic regime, how the how the flow in the Boise River might change in the coming century, and what are the ramifications of that for um, for our societal systems, for the way that we manage water, for the way that crops farmers grow crops, right? Um, so um, I'll I'll share with you um, uh, a vignette um, of a particular piece of research that just came out of our group. Um, so. One of the, the models that I'm going to focus significantly on is um, a model known as the, the weather research and forecasting model. So, you know, it's one of the models that we use here. Um, the weather research and forecasting or WARF model um, is a coupled land atmosphere model. So it simulates the dynamics of the flow of air in the atmosphere. Um, it also simulates the exchanges of, of water and energy with the boundaries of the landscape, the boundaries of a domain, as well as kind of at the land atmosphere interface. And it does this um, using a, a, a whole bunch, a whole suite of kind of physics and math um, and comp computation. I see Grady Wright was on the call earlier. Grady can tell you all about kind of the dynamical core of WARF, as can Mikal. Um, you know, so, you know, we are using these tools kind of as a as a proxy for nature frequently. Right. So we know that they are imperfect tools for representing um, the exchanges of, of moisture and energy between the atmosphere and the land surface. But oftentimes what we're doing is is using them as kind of the best available experimental platform or the most accessible experimental platform to provide some insights into how these systems work and um, what the predictions that these tools provide about how the systems that we care about might be changing in the future. So we often work with these folks to figure out where our blind spots are in terms of that physics and in terms of that those mathematical representations. 
Um, and it's this iterative process of trying to improve these models and these predictions through time so that we get better insight into how the world might be changing. So, um, you know, I could go on and on about Wharf, but what is probably better would be to show you a, um, a movie here about what a Wharf simulation actually looks like. And it's going to, okay, here we go. So, um, so this is a Wharf domain in Colorado. Um, it's one of the domains that we're simulating. Um, what I've plotted here um, on, on the top here is the distribution of temperatures at the land surface. It's draped over topography, so you can sort of see the, the you know, a profile of the to topography here on the, on the bottom of the domain. North is to the top of the image here. Um, and above this, what you're seeing is uh, the, the cloud liquid water fraction, right? So you're seeing the, you're seeing effectively kind of the fraction of clouds um, vertically above the landscape. And when I click play, you'll see this through time, right? And so what you're going to see is a whole month of um, the clouds kind of evolve or the, the, the cloud cover over the landscape, right? With the diurnal fluctuations and the temperature. Right, so you see the mountains of Colorado being colder, the valleys being warmer, but then you kind of see um, these kind of synoptic events that come through and cool the land surface, right? Probably leading to some precipitation. You see the influence of topography on, on air flows here, right? You can see things like cold air pooling, which is actually a pretty cool detail that Wharf can capture. Um, but this is kind of our experimental test bed, right? So, so this, test bed that we have is is what we use kind of as a stand in for nature to be able to to poke and prod at the system to understand how things how the model suggests things might change um, going into the future or under a specific set of circumstances um, so the majority of of um, of of wharf output that is is generated is is not this pretty and one of Michal's students is sort of coping with this right now right um, it produces a lot of data um, and it requires kind of a lot of post processing and a, a lot of um, data reduction in order to to adequately analyze this data um, and answer kind of scientific questions. Um, but the specific use case that I'll address is kind of the prediction of stream flow in the Boise and uh, Payette River system. So the motivating questions behind this research, which was just published this week um, in Hydrological Processes, um, this work was led by my PhD student, Will Rudisil. The motivating question is, how well can we predict stream flow in the Boise and the Payette River systems? And when... Uh, where, when, and why does the model produce errors, right? So we know that the model is not going to be perfect. This is an abstraction of reality. Um, but what we want to understand is, is, you know, what is it about those errors? Where is the model getting it wrong? Why is the model getting it wrong? And in the long run, how can we do a better job with this? So what Will did is he took an existing 20-year historical climate run with the wharf model for the region. So you can think of that as just a, a much longer extension of the movie you just saw. Um, and then we use the climate outputs from that wharf simulation is the input to a hydrologic model that predicts stream flow, soil moisture, snow called wharf hydro um, to predict the historical stream flows over that same period of time. And then what we did is we examined the air characteristics and we looked for clues as to how the model can be improved. And one important thing about this is that this wharf hydro model is kind of actually the backbone of, of NOAA's national water model, right? So the work that we're doing here um, in, in the Boise and Payette River basins um, is, is not only useful for providing insights into how we're doing well or not doing well at making predictions in the Boise and Payette rivers, but because we are examining this national water model or the model that underlies it, um, we can we can make observations and comments that will hopefully be helpful to improving wharf hydro for the benefit of kind of all snow dominated systems in the Western United States. <clears throat> So here's kind of a conceptual um, uh, 
uh, a conceptual diagram of, of the work that Will did, right? So he took the output from this WARF 3.8.1 version model. He gathered the meteorological inputs that are necessary for WARF Hydro. Um, he remapped them to the WARF Hydro domain, which is at a spatial resolution of one kilometer, um, the same as our, our forcing data here. Um, and then he ran the model and performed some calibrations, um, uh, adjusted a few of the parameters um, in order to get better predictions. And then we we took a look at the the um, at those predictions and sort of did our best analysis of of you know what that tells us about you know where we're getting things wrong and why. Another thing that Will did that I'll cover a little bit about, but I'm not going to say too much about, is he actually looked at this as well in kind of a, a, a two directional way. So he performed a coupled experiment, um, which coupled the Wharf Hydro model to the Wharf model, right? So allowing our hydrologic model and the redistribution of water on the surface and then the subsurface to ultimately influence the atmosphere. So for those of you that don't know, this is the Boise um, and Payette River Basin System. So um, we have a, a few, um, so the, the, the um, what I'll point out here is kind of the sub watersheds of the Boise. MC here is Morris Creek. MFB is the middle fork at Boise. SFB is the south fork of the Boise. And SFP is the south fork of the Payette River up here, right? And each, the outlet of each of these watersheds corresponds to a USGS gauge, which is ultimately what we're using for uh, the calibration process. The red triangles that you see here on this map are the snow tell stations. So these are stations where they observe both the precipitation and the snow water equivalent. Um, and these are helpful because um, what we want to try and do is understand in part um, how our predictions of stream flow are potentially related to our errors in the prediction of precipitation. Right, so some of our errors in, in precipitation ultimately wind up as errors in stream flow, but also, um, you know, where are we getting precipitation right, but we're getting stream flow wrong, right? So that might be a clue that something else in the model is, is a miss that we need to kind of take a look at. So what, what Will did is he, um, he used a calibration scheme that's uh, known as a DDS scheme. It's sort of a stochastic scheme for um, doing model calibration. Um, and, and what we were able to do was, was basically kind of um, take a subset of the national water model, right? So kind of cookie cutter out our, our backyard watershed and, um, and uh, do some additional calibration to the model to try and get it closer to our observations. So what you see here is I'll, I'll go backwards here. This is um, the South Fork of the Boise. So um, this is, uh, I believe this is the Boise River at Featherville Gauge. Um, and what you see in the blue dashes here um, is the uh, USGS observed stream flow gauging. So for the, this is for um, water years 19, uh, this is 1999 and 2000. Um, and uh, what we see here um, in the in the yellow is the national water model kind of out of the box right so this is you can kind of think of um, the yellow is kind of what the national weather service or, or NOAA would predict with the model that they're currently using um, and after using this dds scheme um, in purple this is kind of what you see um, what our best prediction is based on kind of a, an, an updated version of, of what we got from the national water model. So what you can see is that in fact, um, through this calibration, we are actually able to, to improve the performance of the model quite substantially in, in a few different ways, right? So our, our peaks and valleys kind of align a little bit better, but at the end of the day, there are still errors in this, right? So we're still not quite, you know, getting as much base flow here in the summer times as we would like. Um, and sometimes our, our peaks are not as high as we need them to be. And sometimes our, our, our peaks that we predict are higher than what we observe, right? So even when we do more calibration, we're still getting errors. And that's what we're, that's what we're kind of eager to, to chase down is, is how could we 
even further improve these predictions in the future? Is there something structural in the model that needs improving? Is there better data sources that need to be input to the model? Um, and you know, this is kind of what we're what we're interested. So we we did this for those four watersheds, and um, you can think of these as kind of a, a blow up of the graphic that you just saw for all four of those watersheds, um, and all twenty years of our predictions. Um, and on the right here, what you have is is the daily stream flow bias distribution, right? So this is just a measure of day by day how well does the model predict the average stream flow, right? And so this is the, the PDF of those errors. And so, you know, what we see is generally speaking, um, uh, which is terribly interesting and terribly frightening at the same time, is that um, the mean of these distributions is often close to zero, right? But the distribution of our errors is often very non-normal, but also bimodal, right? So. Um, there's a, a, a period of time in which our errors tend to be um, a, above the observed discharge, and then there's a more frequent occurrence in which um, our, our, our prediction errors tend to be below the, the, the observed discharge, right? So this immediately kind of leads us to think, right, like there's, there's maybe a couple of different things going on that are producing errors in our, in our model, right? So um, these uh, under predictions kind of tend to be, if you go back here, tend to be associated with under predictions in the base flow, right? But these over predictions are often sort of, you know, predictions where the model is suggesting that um, there was a rapid response to some precipitation event when the observations say, in fact, no, not much really actually happened. So what we want to do is drill even deeper to these predictions to understand um, you know, when is it that our model forcings uh, could be better versus um, when is it that our, when is it true that something kind of more complicated is going on in the model? And so what Will did is he took for each of these rivers kind of this um, distribution of wharf hydro of, of bias in the predictions on an annual basis. Um, so this is kind of how we're doing um, over the entire water year in terms of predicting the, the volume of stream flow. Um, and we looked at this as a function of um, our errors in prediction of, of precipitation at these individual snow tell sites, right? And the X, Y, the scatter plots that you see here are effectively a, a plot of the, you know, this, this is a plot of the error in the prediction of the annual volume of stream flow versus the annual volume of precipitation, right? So those places where you see strong correlations um, between the predictions in stream flow and the predictions of precipitation, those are places where you can say, well, you know, you messed up because your precipitation seems like it was not right, right? Either it was biased or it had an error in it, right? But these are locations where, um, or these are circumstances in which Im improvements in the precipitation predictions should likely lead to improvements in the prediction of discharge. But I'd point out as well, um, and my colleague Anna Bergstrom and I are, are on this right now, that um, some of these watersheds, so Moores Creek in particular, which importantly is kind of an unregulated watershed that um, drains directly into Lucky Peak. And so the US Army Corps of Engineers is kind of keeps an eye on it as, as kind of their wild child. Um, it really doesn't have any, um, there's not a lot that it's correlated with in terms of errors and prediction. There are a few of these sites where there are you know, weak to moderate correlations between errors in stream flow and errors in precipitation. But it turns out that these um, these stations are not actually particularly close to Moore's Creek. And the precipitation gauge that's closest to Moore's Creek shows little to no correlation at all, right? So this suggests to us that Moore's Creek is a watershed in, in which something is just kind of going weird. Either there's something not represented in the model correctly, um, or there's kind of you know something more fundamentally about our data input that's that's kind of not not correct. 
right? So this is a, a circumstance in which this set of um, this set of analyses has led us to a whole additional set of questions that we would like to be able to answer. Um, because Wharf Hydro is a spatially distributed model, moreover, right? We can also we can also look at um, you know the a broader set of metrics um, uh, that help us potentially identify you know where we might might be getting things wrong, right? So if the discharge is wrong, what else is wrong, or what else is kind of biased high because our discharge is biased low, and vice versa. So I'm not going to spend too much. Um, time on this figure, um, but what I will point out, right, is that we can look at things like the amount of evapotranspiration, we can look at how that relates to the temperature, um, and how that relates to, um, you know, things like the sensible heat flux, as well as the soil moisture, to ultimately kind of understand, okay, what, where, where, what are the set of processes? Is it evapotranspiration? Is it soil moisture redistribution? That are kind of leading our model astray in these landscapes. Okay, so um, so this is an open set of questions, um, and you know, like I said, we're it, what I love about this, and um, both as kind of a scientist, but also as somebody who has to write proposals to keep graduate students funded, um, is that you know this set of um, investigations has led us to some really interesting questions that we didn't have when we started that need answering if we're to to better improve our predictions of, of stream flow in a changing climate. Okay, so the third part of this story, right, is, is um, can cloud computing help us with these workflows, right? So obviously, or, you know, I what I hope you recognize is that we're producing data sets and tools that are hopefully helpful to um, not just other scientists, but actual stakeholders that might need this information to make better decisions, to to manage our water more efficiently. Um, and so one might think, well, you know, how can we get some of this information or these tools or do some of these workflows in the cloud so that it's more broadly available to end users, be they, you know, folks in the federal water management agencies or nonprofits and NGOs like the Idaho Conservation League or the Nature Conservancy to be able to use. So, um, so about the cloud, right? So the cloud is increasingly important in computational earth and environmental science. So um, all of the, the CMIP-6, so the Coupled Model Intercomparison pro uh, Project, right? So um, those climate model runs that ultimately inform the, the latest um, IPCC um, assessment report, the AR6, um, all of that data is stored in the cloud and it's stored in commercial cloud actually, right? So it's available through Amazon Web Services and they are hosting it because it's kind of a societally important data set, right? But it is already in the cloud. Um, in addition to that, um, the uh, NASA is now kind of rapidly, um, uh, you know, rapidly moving towards making all of its data available in the cloud. Right, all future NASA data from NASA satellites will be hosted in the cloud. Right, so so cloud um, is is driving, um, or you know, the 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 availability of data storage in the cloud is is driving these organizations, these national and federal organizations to move towards the cloud, right? So on some level, we kind of can't get away from this, right? So we have to figure out what it is we're actually doing. So many of our hydrologic modeling workflows and use cases actually fit well in a cloud computing model, right? So those model runs that um, that, that I just showed you from Will, right? Um, they, they, we didn't have to do them in a forecasting mode, right? So we didn't need them done today, right? We could we could allow them to run whenever, whenever there was a spare com computational cycle, um, uh, right? Um, you know, we could let the model run. We're not in any kind of real time crunch to have the, that modeling workflow done. Um, and in addition to that, um, a lot of those hydrologic models um, are not as computationally in as in intensive as as the climate model, um, as the corresponding climate models like WARF. So 
we think that there's at least space for some of these use cases to be able to fit. Um, in addition to that, right, this push towards open and reproducible computing tools, um, right, if we are providing the tools to analyze our data, if we're providing our data, right, and we're, we're documenting our code and, you know, providing examples and things like Jupyter Notebooks to be able to show people what we're doing and allow them to port what they're doing to, to apply that to our data set, um, you know, then it, it, you know, the cloud has this potential opportunity to, to bring um, this computational research closer to the decision makers, right? So it can shorten the path between us as computational researchers and, and, and those folks actually getting that information and using it to make better informed decisions. But Right, right now, there's an urgent need for effective training and onboarding, right? So um, our colleagues in computer science, for a variety of reasons, right, they get some really solid cloud computing training. But this isn't something that a lot of that's that's available or even frequently approachable to many domain scientists, right? So I am new at this, right? And so I'm trying to learn about this and learn and get better at cloud computing. Um, so that I can train those of you in the audience that are actual domain scientists or computational scientists that um, aren't as familiar with the cloud and will wind up kind of using your computational science to benefit domains, um, domain scientists. So again, I, I mentioned that, you know, what we're trying to do is port some of those modeling workflows, some of those, those chains of, of uses of, of models and data and code into the cloud. And I thought what I would do is just sort of illustrate kind of, you know, what the legacy modeling workflow looks like, right? So this is kind of circa 2009 when I was a, a PhD student, right? This is how we would do things. And I picked on myself here in, um, in, this, little, uh, in this little snippet here, right? So we would go acquire some data, right? You know, sometimes it was hosted on an FTP site um, sometimes literally you had to get a disk of it right from somebody. Um, we would run a model that was often on an on premises machine. Sometimes it was actually kind of a, a tower, you know, under your desk. And then we would write a paper. Um, and ultimately, you know, there would be some line in there, maybe that the data, you know, this data is available on request to the authors. Right. And now we know that, you know, anytime we see this now, we, we give an eye roll to it, right? Like that's just, that's not the way, you know, we as, as good computational scientists want to function these days. So the future is, is open, right? So as the previous vignette sort of showed, um, a lot of that was kind of, you know, due to open source, um, open source and open data sets, right? So the Wharf Hydro model is open source. We were cookie cuttering out um, the Boise and Payette River systems from this, um, you know, Kuasi domain subsetter, subsetter, right? Um, the wharf model itself is open source. So, you know, th this is only occurring, you know, more rapidly is, is our workflows are open source. We need to kind of be transparent in what we're doing so that folks can benefit from, from that great work, right? So that they can apply what we've done, we can apply what they do, and we all kind of benefit by, by this approach. So the building blocks of a newer model are there, right? Um, as I mentioned, the, the CMIP6 data is already in the cloud. It's already hosted in AWS. There are a variety of cloud computing um, providers out there, right? Um, GCP, Azure, AWS all provide a very large variety of computational machinery um, that would potentially allow us to replicate the same exact modeling workflows in the cloud. And because of their nature, right, because they're serving a very broad audience, um, the diversity of, of those platforms that are available is only increasing through time, right? Almost every week, some kind of new capability gets added to one of these cloud platforms. Right. And so one of the challenges is just keeping up with that, right? Trying to understand how I might be able to and whether it's a good idea to use that new bell or whistle that AWS is providing next week. Um, and of course, right, um, the, 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 the data that's input to our workflows um, is, is of um, 
you know, is hosted in the cloud. So the data we generate could also be hosted in the cloud, again, if, if we're willing to kind of pay for it. At the same time, there are now kind of whole communities that have developed around supporting a lot of this, right? So the Pangeo community, um, for those of you that happen to use X-Array, right, um, you, you may have already encountered Pangeo. Uh, those of you that are hydrologists have probably heard about Kuasi and HydroShare, and most of you will have heard about, you know, Jupyter Notebooks and Jupyter Hubs, right, and the way that, you know, they allow us to provide open and um, accessible data and computational sharing framework. So the building blocks are there. So um, here's a little bit about the project that um, I'm undertaking now. This is a new project that's funded by a relatively new program at the National Science Foundation called the Mid-Career Advancement Program. And what they are wanting is new insights on existing problems um, or identifying new but related problems previously inaccessible without new methodology or expertise, right? So this for me is about kind of retraining myself to be that same hydrologic modeler, but one that's just um, more savvy in the cloud um, and, um, and able to kind of train the next set of students to be able to, to use the cloud and know when it's appropriate to use it and, and when it's not appropriate to use the cloud. So the, the proposal itself was sort of formulated around kind of three things that we frequently do as, as modelers, right? So those of us that use models, right? Um, and associated with each of these use cases is kind of a research, research objective and an educational objective, right? So for me, I'm kind of doing this research, but at the same time, building the educational material to, to allow my students to achieve these educational objectives, right? So, um, so what we want to do is use cloud computing to produce a regional hydroclimatic climatic, um, data set. Um, but then we want to be able to train students to be able to design, build, and use a computing environment to run a model in the cloud. Right. Um, same thing, but for analyzing that data. Right. So using an interactive computing environment, something like a Jupyter Hub to perform analyses on a large data set in the cloud and then also to share that data. Right. So the next research objective is to say, OK, I've analyzed this data that I produced in the cloud. Now I want to be able to share it and share it in um, an effective way. Right. So um, this is kind of where we get into to questions about, you know, the, the cost of, of sharing data and egress fees associated with cloud, um, cloud data sets, right? How do we provide tools and knowledge and expertise so that we can um, analyze as do as much of this close to the data set as possible and only egress the results of our analyses. So the wiring diagram looks a little bit different, right? So the idea here is we're doing kind of a, um, a large ensemble of runs with a model that's similar to WARF, but computationally less intensive. We're using that WARF hydro model to again, make predictions about how, um, how stream flow and snow will change in the, in the Snake River Basin in the future. And then we're setting up some infrastructure to be able to use these materials for, you know, classes like water in the West or, um, you know, my computing classes, modeling and, and um, research computing in the future to be able to support some of our, our learning objectives, but also to share it more broadly with the community, right? Um, making this uh, available or visible through, for instance, Kuwazi HydroShare and other places so that folks at, for instance, the um, Idaho Department of Water Resources or USGS could do some analyses um, of their own in the cloud and ultimately pull what they need back to their um, back to their own work setting. So really what this is about is adding stakehold adding value to stakeholders, right? So there are folks that originate um, data um, in the cloud, right? So these are the provisioners of, of um, the CMIP data the people that develop models like Wharf and Wharf Hydro. Um, and then there's those of us that are basic and applied researchers that bring local context to these um, data sets through additional modeling analysis and interpretation. And our work ultimately supports those managers and decision makers 
who have knowledge and information about data gaps um, in order to help them make better decisions and, and better management and, and policy decisions about managing our water resources. So beyond these projects, right, um, this project, what I'm really interested in is, you know, how we integrate these training opportunities into our existing curricula, right, both in the geosciences and in computing and elsewhere. Um, and what are innovative ways to share this training across institutions, right? So making sure that it's not just Boise State that's benefiting from this, but other institutions as well. Um, and how do we extend this training to workforce and workforce development to partners in those agencies, right? So those folks that are not in graduate schools, graduate school, but um, folks at IDWR and USGS, um, you know, to be able to kind of use a Jupyter notebook to be able to access that data um, and, and do their own analyses um, to meet their own needs, right? How do we provide them with the training, right? So those are kind of some of the things that I'm thinking about associated with this project. The other thing, which is kind of the, the last thing, the last slide in this presentation um, is that I, I definitely did want to mention the, the broader impacts effort in this project. So um, a part of this will be using a version of the WARF model um, that has been dockerized to be able to deploy on a Raspberry Pi and bringing that into um, some middle school uh, opportunities, some uh, you know, teacher um, teacher research opportunities for middle school teachers in the Nampa School District, right? And um, one of the undergrads in Water in the West, um, Eddie Franco, is actually going to be helping me with this this summer, right? So we're hoping to get this to the Nampa School District, um, and in particular, potentially, you know, make some of those um, training materials available, not just in English but in Spanish, to kind of serve uh, a much broader um, a much broader crowd. So with that, um, I will just wrap up and say thank you all very much for coming. And um, I'd be happy to answer any questions that folks have.